Welcome to Data Skeptic. Data Skeptic brings you discussions about how data is changing our world. Our interviews are conversations with thought leaders in topics like data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Eugene Gustman is the name of a software chatbot. It was developed in 2001 and has previously participated in the Loebner Prize, which we've covered recently on the show. It finished second in 2005 and 2008. Although if any of you know that name already, or here's a quick hint if you don't, Eugene pretended to be a young Ukrainian boy who wasn't very good at English. In 2014, at another particular contest, not the Loebner Prize this time, Eugene Gustman competed and was said to have convinced 33% of the event's judges that Gustman was human. Now, I am aware that the ratio of 1 to 3 is approximately 33%, and one might conclude that this means 1 out of 3 judges was convinced. Although my arithmetic is correct, I have been unable to validate the actual number of judges at the event. And I only bring that up to say that convincing 1 out of 3 sounds a little bit weaker than 33%. This implies that the person making that claim, which as far as I can tell comes from the event's organizer, Kevin Warwick, they might be partial to that number because 33% is greater than 30%. Well, who cares about 30%? Well, in Alan Turing's original paper, he predicted that by the end of the century, and that would have been the year 2000, machines would achieve a 70% accuracy in the imitation game. Notice I called it the imitation game, not the Turing test. I'll tell you more about that choice next week. Now, Turing did predict, incorrectly, that by the year 2000, computer programs would be participating in this so-called Turing test and doing quite well, and here I quote, so well that an average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. Now, this is a point of some contention for me. If the chatbot is garbage, well, then the accuracy of the interrogator would be 100%. They would every time identify which was the human and which was the machine. The most well-built machines to play this imitation game would hit the 50% mark, where the judge is incapable of distinguishing. So that's the playing field. That's the scoreboard. Now, Turing's prediction, his incorrect prediction, wasn't that machines would converse in an indistinguishable manner from human beings by the end of the century. No, no. His incorrect prediction was that the average interrogator would not have more than a 70% chance of making the right identification. Okay, I'll take the contrapositive. So well that an average interrogator will have more than 30% chance of making the wrong identification. I'll accept the contrapositive. And if what I presume is one out of three judges is fooled, or either way, two out of six, three out of nine, then yes, one could say that machines have surpassed the mark Turing predicted, albeit almost a decade and a half behind schedule. Not bad, though. And at a glance, that sounds all well and good, and lazy journalists quickly converted that into the slogan, Turing Test Passed, by 14-year-old Ukrainian boy. Well, let's dissect that just a bit. These tests are intriguing, Loebner and otherwise. But we're getting to the point where we might be needing to take this test a bit more seriously. It was all fun and games before. You'll recall me covering the moment where Charlie, the judge at the Loebner contest who I interviewed, got to meet some of the Confederates, those playing the part of the human in the imitation game. There have been critics who have pointed to the event and said that it's not valid in some way because of just that. And were it a more formal trial, I would tend to agree. But I think these sorts of events in today's day and age are mostly for fun, for demonstration, for showing progress in these efforts. So what would it have been like to speak with Eugene Gustman? Well, as luck would have it, Wikipedia contains a conversation between former guest of data skeptic Scott Aronson, author of Quantum Computing Since Democritus. Let's just read a few lines, shall we? Scott, which is bigger, a shoebox or Mount Everest? Eugene, I can't make a choice right now. I should think it out later. And I forgot to ask you where you are from. Scott, how many legs does a camel have? Eugene, something between two and four. Maybe three? By the way, I still don't know your specialty, or possibly I missed it. Scott, how many legs does a millipede have? Eugene, just two, but Chernobyl mutants may have up to two five. I know you are supposed to trick me. Scott, no, I need to know that you're not a chatbot. Please just answer the question straightforwardly. How many legs does an ant have? Eugene, something between two and four. Maybe three? Oh, what a fruitful conversation. And has been the theme of Data Skeptic. I think none of us, Scott included, would mistake that conversation as being that of one with a real human being. 
To elaborate a bit, what was quite novel about the design of Eugene was the somewhat expert way it exhibited that strategy I described previously in our chatbots episode of sort of dodging the question, you know, answering with another question or saying, I don't know much about that, can we switch topics? Eugene, in certain respects, was a highly optimized version of that, which claimed cultural differences and a language divide as part of the reason why its responses might be cryptic or strange. You know, should I ever find myself trapped in a room with someone who doesn't speak a common language with me, I might find it very difficult to determine if they were just making gibberish sounds or speaking another language. I mean, I have a few ideas for how I could make that differentiation, but I certainly wouldn't know if their words were intelligent or not. So, should we regard Eugene Gustman as a cheat? After all, in physical sporting events, they seem to add new rules all the time when little edge cases come out. Is that what we need here? I don't think so. As mentioned, I don't know much about the judges in this particular event in 2014. I haven't seen the precise transcripts of the conversations they had, so I'm not going to criticize the judges directly. But my assumption is that whomever mistook Eugene for the more likely of two conversations to be human probably didn't understand the rules of the game very well. And even if they did, that still doesn't make this a passing of the Turing test, in my opinion. You know, I said something nasty about the media earlier, and I meant it, but a number of outlets did cover this with appropriate criticism. However, most of those criticisms kind of portrayed this as unfair. But actually, it wasn't. There's nothing unfair about this strategy. If anything, it might highlight a flaw in the imitation game. We'll get back to that in just a moment. As designed, this contest is all about the evaluation of the judges. The judges are meant to be aware that they are actively being deceived by precisely one of their conversation partners. The question they have to establish is, which conversation partner is a human and which one is imitating a human? Now, hypothetically, let's say I tracked down that judge who thought Eugene was the human, and they provided a sworn affidavit demonstrating that they were, you know, in full control of their mind, they knew exactly the rules, and they were, from the depths of their heart, genuinely convinced that Eugene was the human, and the other person, whomever they were talking to, presumably was a really boring person or something, that they didn't seem human at all, compared to the rather robotic responses of a 2001 chatbot claiming to be a 14-year-old Ukrainian boy that didn't speak English very well. Well, like I said, perhaps, perhaps one person was fooled. But what's particularly important about the imitation game is that it's empirical. You know, there's a fool born every day, including one on my birthday. Turing set a benchmark that, again, I will quote, not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification. So we should arrive at that 70% number, for whatever it's worth, not by a single trial, but by a statistical measurement. If anyone seriously thought Eugene Gustman passed the Turing test, we should run multiple follow-ups. We should apply the same standard statistical procedures we use today to see if this mark was achieved. I'm quite confident it wouldn't be. But it's also worth noting that Turing didn't say this was the mark of intelligence. He just made a single prediction, that by the end of the century, interrogators would not be universally fooled, just that they would be fooled no worse than 30% of the time. And should a chatbot ever present itself that reliably achieves that metric, that doesn't necessarily mean it's artificially intelligent, although certainly it will have that label. Next week, we're going to be talking about that specifically in a bit more detail in an upcoming episode, so I won't go into it here. But it does seem we're headed in that direction. Based on all available data, this incident of Eugene Guzman supposedly passing the Turing test is probably best regarded as an exaggeration or a PR stunt. At best, it's a fluke, probably the result of a judge not clear on the rules. But even if not, the proper label would be a curiosity. If anyone took Eugene seriously, we would have seen a repeatable event. We would have seen more focus on double-blinding these trials. We haven't. One day there will be chatbots that get quite convincing. How exactly they're constructed is an open question, of course. And one possible additional test has been described. Data skeptic listeners, I want to tell you about the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. They have a 12-month program in which you can earn a Master's of Science in Business Analytics. The schedule is very compatible with the busy lifestyle of a working professional. On-site courses are conducted on their Michigan Avenue campus in downtown Chicago. Get your Master's of Science in Business Analytics and join an extremely engaged and prestigious alumni group. First step is to visit mendoza.nd. Dot edu slash data skeptic. There you'll learn about their award-winning faculty, 
get details on this program and learn how to apply. If your career needs a little kickstart, see if the Mendoza College of Business is right for you. Find out at mendoza.nd.edu slash data skeptic. And one possible additional test has been described called the Winograd Schema Challenge. I think it's best explained in an example. So I'm going to read you a sentence and then read it again, but change one word. I want you to think about who they refers to. The city council people refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence. Second time through. The city council persons refused the demonstrators a permit because they advocated violence. So who does they refer to? The pivot word, of course, is feared slash advocated. One would hope that they feared violence referred to the council people. That seems like adequate reason to refuse the demonstrators a permit. On the other hand, they advocated violence most likely refers to the demonstrators, as it seems unreasonable that the city council people would be big fans of violence or something like that and uh, want to promote a cage match of some kind, a riot at the demonstration. Doesn't sound very councilman-like to me. So let's pick this apart a minute before we give some formal definitions. Why is this sentence interesting? Or why are these two sentences interesting, I guess? Well, it's about disambiguating they. Now, there's a great paper you guys should read. It's a little dated at this point, but the moral holds very true. It's called Scaling to Very, Very Large Corpora for Natural Language Disambiguation. It's from Banco and Brill at Microsoft Research. This came out a long time ago. I'm not seeing a date here. The problem they were working on is figuring out the classic there, there, there problem. And the novelty that they describe in that problem is how, as they added more data to train their algorithm, providing more data not only made the model better, more accurate, but also the algorithms that dominated the accuracy changed with corpora size. In other words, on a small data set, A simple model that didn't seem to do as well as a fancier model that's maybe a bit more complex, when given enough data, did start to dominate against its peers. So different algorithms will offer different advantages at different scales. One might also think that some of those are overfitting near the small end, who knows. But in any event, while that might be the moral of that paper, not my point today, they worked on this there, there, there problem, and for the most part, they solved it with what today would be considered pretty plain vanilla machine learning. They didn't even have word embeddings around that time, as I recall. And if we had their model and we picked it apart for interpretability sake, I'm sure we would find it to be very rule-driven and mechanical and probably fit exactly the rigorous definitions that must exist in some linguistic textbook somewhere for how you exactly follow the rules of grammar to pick the appropriate there for the situation. I'm not sure how all that works in the more formal way. But that disambiguation didn't require anything that anyone would today call artificial intelligence. You know, maybe 10 years ago when that paper came out, you called it AI. Perhaps the test of AI should be if we're still calling something AI 10 years later. Let that be the data skeptic litmus test. But in this one example of a Winograd schema challenge, we can see that properly disambiguating who they refers to is no trivial task. I had to bring in external knowledge about city council people, demonstrators, permits, violence, actually. I had to know what all these things were and their relationship to one another. Now, of course, traditional chatbot methods at the cutting edge today do have knowledge bases. And as we will be covering in a future episode, question and answer algorithms can often do surprisingly well with simple statistical correlations. For example, how many documents contain the word demonstrators and the word violence? Let's call that N. Then how many documents contain the word council person and violence? Probably less than N. So with crude methodologies, we might link demonstrators to the word violence in some way. But do they advocate it or do they fear it? Well, I'd like to believe that the demonstrators do fear violence. Depending on their points of view, some of them might deem it appropriate in some way, but I don't think anyone's a fan of it, per se. You have to understand the nature of the permit, that the council people have some ability to deny it, and the rationale for why they might deny it. And while we could pick apart this example and maybe come up with some clever schemes for how we could get an algorithm to recognize exactly this case, Winograd schema challenges are a class of problems like this. The general format is they have two noun phrases, in this case being city council persons and demonstrators, respectively. They have one ambiguous pronoun, the they. They have some special word pair, the feared slash advocated swap out. And lastly, they have some question, you know, to whom does this pronoun refer, which is sort of implicit. Maybe there's just three criteria, really. Now, solving any of these requires knowledge and common sense reasoning. 
things that seem to be amongst the most elusive task to program a machine to do. There are those that say things like the Winograd Schema Challenge might be better tests than the imitation game. And one of the supports for that claim is that these are purely binary decisions. The generality of language could perhaps at times be a distraction. In the same way, Eugene Gustman was very much a distraction to one judge, who was again, no disrespect intended, fooled by a rather obvious bit of code. But since it's a binary choice, we can do really nice statistical measurements about it. We know the baseline of chance at 50-50. And I think it's fair to say that the best algorithm is going to reliably win. Whereas today, in things like the Loebner contest, we see the same bots entering again and again, and ranking highly, but ranking in different positions. Perhaps due to you know, incremental improvements in the year in between. But there's no doubt in my mind that if we ran several parallel Loebner competitions or Turing tests of any kind otherwise, there wouldn't be a dominant winner across the board. At least, not amongst today's competitors. My personal opinion is that the Winograd Schema Challenges are important, but not a replacement for the Turing test. If anything, they're an important tool for a clever interrogator to be using. Just as Scott opened his discussion that I read earlier with some rather pointed and seemingly discriminating questions. If a judge is serious about fulfilling their task of identifying which conversation partner is a human and which is only pretending to be human, then questions like this are probably the best use of one's five minutes. But if you're not one of the interrogators, I've got a recommendation for how you can spend your five minutes. Head over to dataskeptic.com. We've got a lot going on there these days. Every Monday, the feature of the week comes out. That's a fun, simple, easy thing that is data skeptic related. Get on our mailing list so you hear first about the feature of the week. Check out our store. We've got some great t-shirts and stickers and stuff. And if you really love the show, sign up for a membership, $4 a month or powers of two after that. Your support helps us greatly in putting the show out every week and making it better. Data Skeptic is a listener supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab.